The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe Dramatized by Catherine Chakowska Part 1 In the year 1584, I was living in the province of Gascony, in the chateau of my dear father, Monsieur Saint-Aubert. I was the sole child of my parents to survive infancy. But my story begins at a time of intense sadness for myself and my father. My beloved mother, after a short but virulent illness, had passed away. My father and I mourned her most acutely. I was young and strong and soon recovered my health, if not my spirits. But it seemed to me that my father was pining away before my eyes. Dear Papa, will you not walk out with me and take the air? You are right, Emily. I must rouse myself. But I've been making plans that will involve you too, child. What plans? Emily, we are going to take a journey together. A journey? But are you well enough? It is true that my health has declined sadly since your mother... since she left us. But perhaps if I can breathe the fresh mountain air for a while, my spirits will be renewed and my health too. I hope so. You are everything to me now. I have no one else. I am so afraid of losing you. We must prepare for our journey. I would rather not leave La Vallée. I know it. But a change of scene will be beneficial for both of us. How long will we be away? For many weeks. You see, there is another reason for my undertaking such a journey. What is that? You know we have never been rich, Emily. We have been rich in all that matters. Mm, true. But still, it would pain me to have to sell this beautiful place. Sell La Vallée? Oh, well, well. I hope it will not come to that. But we need only leave Teresa and a very small number of servants in the house while we are not in residence. Then you are right. We had much better go. But where will our journey take us? Let us walk in the gardens and I will tell you. We will travel in a very leisurely fashion. For I can manage nothing more strenuous, I fear, along the shores of the Mediterranean and towards Provence. The Mediterranean? I have always wanted to go there. I hope the journey will be both enjoyable and educational for you, Emily. I sometimes fear that you have led a very sheltered life here. I have been happy. Mm, but it has ill prepared you to face the world, my daughter. We will be leaving in a few days. So soon? You must go and prepare. And I must do likewise. On the night before our departure, we retired early to our respective rooms. But later, I went below again to fetch my drawing instruments, which I wished to take with me. On my return, I saw a lamp still burning in my father's room and tapped softly on the door. Father? Father? Why does he not answer? Can he be ill? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, that it should ever have come to this. He is in the little closet in the corner there. What can be wrong with him? Oh, my dear, how could such a thing befall you? He is holding a miniature. Can it be my mother? No. No, it is a portrait of a lady, but not my mother. And yet he is so sad. How tenderly he raises it to his lips. Oh, my dear. What can it mean? But how can I ask him what he does not voluntarily tell me? No. I must go to bed before he sees me. We travelled without servants, save for our coachman, Michael, leaving La Vallée in the care of our old housekeeper, Teresa. My father was at first sunk in his customary melancholy, but my fancy was much taken with the grandeur of the objects around, and gradually I yielded to many delightful impressions. I looked with extreme pleasure over the mountain pine forests and towards the vast plains below, enriched with woods, towns, blushing vines, and plantations of almonds, palms, and olives. Did I not tell you, Emily, the world is a beautiful place? It is wonderful. Every sight is so new to me. But, Father, the sun is low in the sky, 
and we are not yet come to our lodgings. I know it. I had planned to stop overnight at a little hamlet close by, but we are not yet come to it. I see no sign of habitation, Papa. And neither do I. Michael! Uh, Michael! Sir? Uh, will you stop the carriage, Michael? I must speak to you. Well, sir. Woo, then. Steady, steady. Woo, woo, woo. Oh, come and look at the mountains, Papa. It is so lovely. Let me help you down. Michael, we are not yet come within sight of any village. That's the truth, sir. Michael, do you know where we are? Uh, a long way from La Vallée, that's for sure. Are you saying that we are lost? Not lost, sir. No, I wouldn't say we were lost. There is only one road through these mountains and we are on it. How can we be lost? Oh, we had better set off again then. Emily! The air is so very sweet up here. Oh, Michael is a most provoking man. Perhaps he does not know where the village is. But we must have lodgings and we must find them soon. Otherwise, we shall be benighted on the mountains. Even a shepherd's hut would be preferable. What was that? Sir, I think it was a shot. It came from among the trees there. Oh, Lord, I hope it is not bandits. Get back into the carriage. You go quickly, quickly. And... <laughs> Hurry, sir. Hurry. Run. Come on, get up there. Wait. What now? There is a young man ahead, Father. He has dogs with him and a gun, I think. I see him. He does not look like a bandit. No. No, I think he is only a huntsman. Michael, wait! Whoa there! Just as you wish, monsieur. Young man, a, a word, if you please. Down, boy. Down! Good day to you, sir. Mademoiselle. Can I be of any service to you? I hope so. We are looking for somewhere to pass the night. Is there a hamlet hereabouts? There is. I will gladly lead you there. Thank God. But I fear you will be wretchedly accommodated. The inhabitants of these mountains are a simple people, and their dwellings have few comforts. Then you are not a native of this place? No, sir. I am only a wanderer here, like yourselves, I fancy. But if you will follow me, we will see what can be done. I will walk ahead with my hounds, and your coachman can follow. Come. This way, sir. You and the young lady. Careful, Emily. The, the step is very uneven. Come in, sir, and Ansel. Come in and welcome. I'm afraid this is the best that can be done, sir. But I think you will find that it is a decent enough cottage, and it is very clean. This is your own lodging, monsieur, is it not? We cannot think of depriving you of it. I could not sleep here knowing that you and the young lady were so ill provided. To be sure, there's a comfortable stable where the young gentleman can sleep. And your coachman, too. I'll give him extra straw and some blankets. This is much too kind of you, sir. No, she is right. I am young and strong and can make shift for myself. But will we see you in the morning? Aye. I will breakfast with you, if I may. Then I will walk a little way with you on your journey, if you like. We are greatly indebted to you, sir. I hope you sleep well. Good night, my lady. He is a handsome young man, is he not? I feel I have seen him somewhere before. I thought so too. I wonder where he is from and what his family is. Well, well, we will ask him in the morning. In spite of my weariness, it was a long time before I fell asleep that night. The young stranger was much in my mind. He was possessed of a tall, handsome figure, with the agility of one who has spent many weeks wandering in the mountains. I am ashamed to say that I even dreamed of him. I fear you must have passed a restless night, sir. Not at all. I can sleep anywhere. <laughs> Though I will admit that your coachman snores abominably. <laughs> <laughs> More bread, Emily. Thank you. Uh, my daughter and I are wondering if we have seen you before, monsieur. Uh, what is your name? My name is Valancourt. And you are monsieur and mademoiselle Saint-Aubert, are you not? Of La Vallée in Gascony. We are, and I know you now. You are the younger son of our neighbour, Valancourt. Exactly. I knew your father well and was acquainted with your elder brother. He has inherited the family home, and I must make shift for myself. But I mean to see a little of our lovely countryside and then perhaps make a career for myself in the army. An honourable profession. Emily, if you are finished, we should be on our way. There is a long day's journey ahead of us. Will you come with us a little way, sir? If your father permits it. We will be very glad of your company. 
is all ready, Michael. It is, sir. And the horses are well rested. Which is more than can be said for myself. Uh, Monsieur Valancourt, will you not come in the carriage with us? No, no. I will go on foot. It will be a pleasant ramble for me. But perhaps later on, your daughter might like to walk with me for a short distance. Yes. I should like that very much. Then we will be on our way. Oh, get up there, then. Come on. This is a very pleasant and ingenuous young man, Emily. He seems a model of courtesy. Aye. The family is an old one and of good reputation. Indeed, I think he has never been at Paris. He has not yet been ruined by the world. I shall be sorry to part from him. And I. Some time later, when we stopped beside a mountain stream to drink its waters and eat a little of the fruit that the kind cottager had given us, Monsieur Valancourt joined us. Ah, oh, this is very good. It is like a magical elixir. So fresh and sweet and cold. I see you are of a romantic disposition, Mademoiselle Saint-Aubert. It is one which I share myself. My Emily is fanciful, to be sure. She has lived a sheltered life, and her imagination is lively. Sir, it occurs to me that I have no other pressing commitments just now. Perhaps I could accompany you for part of your way. Indeed, it will worry me to leave you and your daughter unprotected in these wild mountains. Michael is very capable, to be sure. But I am young and strong and know all the tracks and pathways of this place. That is true. And it would make me easier in my mind to have your protection. It would be my pleasure. Very well, then. Perhaps you would accompany us as far as the Mediterranean coast. And so Monsieur Valancourt came with us on our journey. We found him to be a frank and generous young man but also impetuous, wild, and somewhat romantic. Sometimes he rode in the carriage with us, and sometimes Valancourt and I walked alone together through the beautiful wilderness. We were alike enchanted by the majestic mountains, whose appearance was changing every instant with the alternate sunlight and cloud. All the while, I was hoping to see my father's health improve, but alas, it was not to be. I am very weary, Emily and wish for nothing so much as rest in my own home. Oh, sir, we are many, many miles from that lovely place. But we will soon be at Arles, and there you may rest for a while. But it is at Arles that we have to part from Valancourt. He will return home to Gascony before us. I know it. I have come to rely upon him so very much. And I too. When we return to La Vallée, we will invite him to stay with us. Would that please you, Emily? More than anything else. <laughs> I thought as much. Sir, I must leave you now. But I will miss your companionship on my return journey. I hope that you will never pass La Vallée in the future without favouring us with a visit. I am sure my daughter agrees with me. Indeed, we are very sorry to lose you. I am very sorry to go. I wish you a safe journey, the restoration of your health, sir, and a happy return to La Vallée. You are very kind. My dear sir, my dear young lady, farewell. That is a very promising young man, Emily. I am glad to have made his acquaintance. He reminds me of the days of my youth. The world was opening to me then. Now I fear that it is closing. Oh, sir! Sir, do not speak so! I hope you have many years to live for your own sake and for mine. Well, I hope it may be so. We continued on our journey, but with each day my father's health failed. At last we reached the Languedoc and wound along the shores of the Mediterranean. Night was falling, and once more we sought lodgings, without much success, for it was the time of the vintage, and all beds were taken. To my alarm, I saw that the languor of illness was on my father, and began to wish very much that Monsieur Valancourt had still been with us. Michael, slow down! Oh, Emily. Slow down! Yes, mademoiselle! <laughs> steady there, steady, steady! My father needs rest. He grows weaker by the moment. Is that not a chateau? Among the trees there? Oh, well, where is it? This chateau. 
I see nothing. I saw a distant turret among the trees. Where, Emily? Where? The last rays of the setting sun shone full on it, and it glowed with a strange, unearthly light. Alas, I'm so very weary. Michael, there is an avenue ahead which appears to lead in the direction of the chateau. Turn that way. Yes, mademoiselle. We turned into a narrow avenue, between woods which became more overgrown as we progressed. It was plain that the whole estate had not been tended for many a long year. And darkness was coming on, particularly here, where the sun did not shine even at midday. Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa there! What is wrong, Michael? Oh, it is a strange, eerie-looking place. Don't you think we'd better turn back? Go a little further yet. And if we see no house, then we will return to the road. There is a figure! Look! Up ahead, through the twilight! I see it. Though whether man or woman, I cannot say. What is happening, Emily? There is somebody lurking among the woods. He may be a bandit. I think we must return to the road, Emily. Let us go back, Michael. Yes, mademoiselle. Come on, then, boy. Come on, come on. Michael turned the carriage around with some alacrity, and we rejoined the road. But we had gone only a little way when my father slumped, fainting in my arms. Michael! Michael! Yes, mademoiselle. Move, move there. What now? My father has fainted. I must fetch help. Will you come and take care of him? To try to revive him. Uh, what am I to do? There is water in the little rivulet by the road. Listen. Eh? What is that noise? Oh. It's coming from the woods. Near the chateau. Do you think we've seen a ghost, Mademoiselle Emily? No, I don't. Don't say such things, Michael. But I must go for help. Here's my handkerchief. <sighs> Bathe my father's head and give him water if he wakes. Don't worry. I'll look after him. I walked hurriedly until I left the shadow of the trees. The eerie singing seemed to pursue me for a while. But soon its place was taken by more worldly song and laughter. At last, I saw peasants dancing and merrymaking before a group of neat cottages scattered around the edges of the wood. I begged them for help, and an elderly man accompanied me back to my father, who I was relieved to see had revived a little in my absence. Oh, father, I was so worried. I am just fatigued by the journey, Emily. We have thought to find lodgings at the castle up there. Perhaps you know it, sir. The chateau cannot accommodate you, my lady. It's scarcely inhabited. And besides, it has an evil reputation. Oh. Uh, but if you'll do me the honour of coming to my cottage, you shall be made most welcome. You are very kind, sir. Thank you. Yeah, come, come, follow me, and I'll see what I can do to make you more comfortable. You will take a little more wine, sir. Uh, no, thank you. Is this your own cottage? It is my daughter's home. So you too have lost your wife. Aye. And now I've come here to live with my daughter and her family. But I hope by God's grace to be reunited with my dear wife hereafter. Tell me, sir, do you know who sings so eerily? Oh, that voice is often heard drifting from the woods, but nobody knows whence it comes. It is so sweet and sad, one would almost think the woods were haunted. I heard it earlier, when I came looking for help. It is very beautiful. They say it comes to warn people of their death. But I've heard it these many years and long outlived the warning. Has nobody had the courage to follow these sounds? They have followed, but they've never seen the singer. And do you know who the chateau belongs to? The Marquis de Villeroy was his owner. The Marquis de Villeroy. Ah. Oh. So that is where we are. I had not realized. I did not know we were so close to the Chateau Leblanc. So that is its name. It was once the Marquis de Villeroy's favourite residence, but many years ago now he took a great dislike to the place. He moved away and has never again set foot within its walls. But we have heard lately that he's dead, and that it's fallen into other hands. Dead? Did you know the Marquis, sir? I did not know the Marquis, but I knew of him. Who succeeds to the estate? Uh... I forgot his title, but he resides at Paris, chiefly. The chateau is still shut up, then? But the old housekeeper and her husband, the steward, have the care of it, but they will not spend a night there. They stay in a cottage hard by. The chateau must be a lonely place. Oh, I would not pass one night there for the value of the whole domain. 
dark deeds were done there. I think they were. Do you know this place, Papa? I know something of its history. How long have you lived here, sir? Oh, almost from my childhood. Then you will remember the late Marchioness. Oh, Monsieur, that I do well. She was a most excellent lady. She was, indeed. And she deserved a better fate, if I may say so. Enough. Enough, my friend. Let the dead rest in peace. Father. No. No, all is well, Emily. I have painful memories, that is all. I think I must go to bed now. I will come and make all ready for you. Oh, thank you, my dear. And thank you, kind sir, for your hospitality. Oh. Emily. If I am better tomorrow, I mean to set out at an early hour. But where are we going? I fear I cannot undertake a longer journey. My health is failing. We must return to La Vallée. I awoke at an early hour, little refreshed, for uneasy dreams had pursued me. My father rose too, but it quickly became apparent that he was not strong enough to stand, let alone travel that day. Oh, oh. Emily! Emily, help me! Take my arm! Let me help you back to bed. Oh, my dear daughter, I must speak to you. Oh, sh Let me get you settled first. Let me make you comfortable, and then we can talk. My dear child, it would be cruel to deceive you. It cannot be long before we must part. Do not say such things, Papa. I'll not listen to them. But I must. There are things that must be said between us, and we cannot waste these last precious moments. You have seen how anxious I am to return home, but you do not know my reasons. Emily, you must give me one promise. Anything. Anything. Nay, nay do not weep so passionately. Listen to me, Emily. Promise that you will do exactly as I tell you. I will. Only... What must I do? The closet, which adjoins my chamber at La Vallée, has a sliding board in the floor. It is the next board but one to the wainscot which fronts the door. Do you think that you can find it? Yes, I'm sure I can. Below this board, you will see a hollow place. Do you, do you understand me? Yes, yes, to be sure. Beneath the board, you will find a packet of papers. <gasps> You must take these papers, my dear child, and burn them all. Burn them as you value your promise to me without looking at them first. Sir, why must this be? It is sufficient for your peace of mind to know that you must. There are besides about 200 louis d'or wrapped in a silk purse, and this money is yours to settle any immediate debts. Oh. Whatever your future circumstances, do your utmost not to sell the chateau. It must always, always be yours, even should you marry. Do not leave me! I fear it will not be in my power to stay. But I have more to tell you. You know my sister, Madame Chiron. I know something of her. She is your only female relative, and I believe... Uh, to be a good woman at heart. I have thought it proper to consign you to her care till you are of age. I cannot bear to think of it. Oh, give me your hand, Emily. Oh. The room grows dark. Night must be coming on. No, it is yet broad day. My dear Papa. Emily. <laughs> He lingered until three in the afternoon, and then my dear father expired without a struggle or a sigh. He was buried in the chapel of a convent close by, and near to the ancient tomb of the Villois family, of which he had seemed to have some secret and tragic knowledge. I too went to the convent, and remained there for some time, reluctant to leave my father's earthly remains, but anxious to return to La Vallée. Before setting out, I determined upon one last visit to my father's grave. One of the nuns offered to accompany me. Sister Agnes was her name. She was tall and 
very thin, kindly enough to me, but with a pale, haggard face and a certain sadness in her eyes. And yet, when I looked at her, I had a sense that she might once have been a woman of great beauty. It will be melancholy for you to visit the old chapel alone at this hour. You are very kind, Sister Agnes, but you need only take me to the door of the chapel where the grave lies. I wish to spend a few moments alone with my father. Very well, but I will wait for you. Saint-Aubert, lying where he wished to be, below the great stone monument of the Villois family. Oh, my dear papa, what am I to do now that I am alone in the world? Mademoiselle, do not linger in this place. There is nothing to fear. Is there not? For you, perhaps. But one could fancy in such a place as this, at such a time that... Vengeful spirits might return. My father showed me nothing but the fondest love in life. Why should he change now? It is not of you I speak, child. Come, the candle burns low. Let us be gone from this place. Quickly. Oh, God, let us go quickly from this place. She turned to go. And for a moment, her pale face in the flickering candlelight seemed haunted by a memory of some past evil. And when she looked at me, there was something very like fear and recognition on her countenance. But I dismissed these thoughts as wild fancy and forgot my mysterious guide in my own grief and in my anxiety to return home to La Vallée as soon as possible. Dear Mamselle, oh, oh, how good it is to see you again. Oh, my poor master. See, his hound has gone to look for him and wonders what has become of him. Teresa! Oh, Teresa! Oh, don't cry so, Mamselle. It breaks my heart to see you. Come indoors. I have some refreshment for you. A little wine, some cake, perhaps. Oh, Teresa, I miss him so now, sit down and compose yourself. All that could come have been here every day to inquire after you and the master. Oh, my lady, do take some food. I prepared these cakes specially for you. I cannot eat yet. Perhaps later, Teresa. Well, I hope so. I will drink a little wine and water and go into the garden for a while. The fresh air will restore me. Very well. But I've dressed a pheasant for your supper, Mistress Emily, and eat it you shall, if I have to feed you with a spoon, as I used to do when you were a baby. Everything is the same, except that he can never, never return here. Who's there? Good God. Can it be? Mademoiselle saint -Aubert. My dear Mademoiselle. I am delighted to see you. I have walked here often in hopes of finding you returned. And tell me, is your father well? Oh, Malenko. He is dead and is buried on the shores of the Mediterranean. And I am so desolate. I miss him so very much. Mademoiselle Emily, I am sorry. I can only mourn with you. He was a kindly man. He was. And I thank you for your sympathy. But why was I not there? You must have been alone and distressed among strangers. I should have been at your side. They were kindly strangers and helped me for my father's sake. Emily, I wish I could stay longer now. If only I could be of more help to you. You are going away? I am to join my regiment in Paris. I see. May I come in the morning and take my leave of you before I go? Yes. Yes, do. But I must go inside. Evening approaches and Teresa will be looking for me. Then I will bid you good night, Mistress Emily. Good night, my dear. I have made a solemn promise to my father, and I must obey him. 
the papers in the little closet. I had better get them out and burn them as he wished. Yes, this is the board. Oh, here they are. And the money likewise. I suppose I must burn the papers unseen. There is a fire in the grate. That will suffice. What is this word? Can it be murder? No. No, I must not look. Terrible as the words seem to be. I must do as he told me and burn them all. <laughs> to hear of a Louis door. Just as he said. But what is this at the bottom of the purse? It is larger than any coin. Why? It is the miniature of a lady. I think it is the same my father wept over. I wonder who she is. My father left no directions concerning this picture. Well, I cannot consign such a sweet face to the flames, but I will carry it with me in his memory. Now I must sleep, for Valancourt will be here in the morning. Monsieur Valancourt, I will be sorry to see you go. I am sorry to leave you. But may I venture to declare the admiration I feel for you? Sir. And at some future period. Oh, Emily. Might I be permitted to call this admiration love? You must not speak to me of such things now. But at some future time, at least let me hope. At some future time, when I am not mourning my father so intensely. Yes, perhaps. Perhaps you will return and see me. What will you do now, Emily? Can you remain here alone without the protection of a parent? My father left me in the care of my aunt, Madame Cheron. She is my only living relative, so far as I know. She begged me to go straight to her house in Toulouse, but I wanted to come home to La Vallée first. She agreed, and I have not heard from her since. Oh, Emily. My dearest, darling Emily. Valancourt, this is not seemly. You must go. Emily, I have long cared deeply for you. Perhaps I may be permitted to pay my respects to your family, to your aunt. It was as though the mention of her name conjured my aunt from the thin air. For at that instant, we heard a hasty footstep approach from behind the plane tree. And turning, we saw that very lady, my father's sister, Madame Cheron. I blushed to see her in such circumstances, but rose instantly to meet her. So, niece, how do you do in your grief? But I need not ask. Your blushing looks tell me you've already recovered from your loss. My looks do me an injustice then, madame. The loss of my father is still a bitter sorrow to me. Well, well, I will not argue with you. But perhaps you will introduce me to this young man. Who is he? Some idle admirer of yours, I suppose. Aunt, this is Monsieur Valancourt, who was known to my father. Emily, I believed you had a greater sense of propriety than to have received the visits of any young man in your present unfriended situation. But, Aunt, he was a friend of my father's. Madame, she speaks nothing but the truth. Well, well, I think you should go now, Monsieur, and leave me to talk to my niece in private. Emily? I think you must go. Farewell, Valancourt. But we shall meet again. I hope so, if God wills it. Goodbye. Goodbye, Emily. And God be with you. My love! I see that it is necessary you should be under the eye of some person who is able to guide you. I must take you into my care. Madame, you do me great wrong. Enough. I am come to take you with me to Toulouse. Madame, I should be very happy to remain here at La Vallée. No doubt you would. And I would certainly have agreed with you if I had not come here to find Monsieur Val... I forget his name. Monsieur Valancourt. His name is Valancourt. Madame, if the purpose of your visit is only to add insult to my sorrows... The purpose of my visit is to undertake the very troublesome task allotted to me by your father. I do not understand you. 
Do you not see the impropriety of receiving the visits of a lover unknown to your family? Madame, he is not my lover, nor is he unknown to my family. He was of great service to my father during our last sad journey. His family is a good one. He is the younger brother of... Oh, the younger brother. And of course he will be a beggar, as most younger brothers are. So like your poor father to take a fancy to this Valancourt after only a few days' acquaintance. But come, let us go into the chateau. You must pack whatever you think necessary, for I am determined that we will return to Toulouse tomorrow. <laughs> Emily, where have you been? I don't approve of these solitary walks before breakfast. But I went no further than your gardens, aunt. In future, you must take my maid, Annette, with you. A young woman who can make assignations at La Vallée is not to be trusted in Toulouse. Whatever do you mean? Oh, ho, all innocents now, are we? Well, well, handsome is as handsome does Emily Saint-Aubert. Let us see if you can behave yourself in future. You insult me more than you can possibly know. Nonsense. Emily, we have a large party expected to dinner. Signor Montoni is coming, who is a very great man in his own country of Italy. His friend Carini will accompany him. You had better wear something suitable. All my clothes are very simple. And you must remember that I am still in mourning for my father. But that should not prevent you from being elegant. Come. Show me what you have. Perhaps I can lend you something more becoming. I confess I did not like Signor Montoni, although my aunt seemed mightily pleased with him. I felt admiration for him mixed with a degree of fear which I could not quite explain. His friend Cavini was friendly enough, but at times assumed an air of tenderness when he spoke to me that alarmed me somewhat. Both men were frequent visitors to the house, but I avoided them as much as I could. My aunt's maid, Annette, proved a cheerful companion to me, but my pleasantest hours were passed alone on the terrace, where I could read and think of La Vallée and of Monsieur Valancourt. Ah, Emily! Aunt? You may be interested to know that Monsieur Valancourt has been here. I have dismissed him. You have sent him away? Of course. Oh, how could you? He asked if he might make court to you. But he had the impertinence to tell me that his fortune is very small and that he is chiefly dependent on an elder brother and on the profession he has chosen. Oh, don't sit there with tears in your eyes, girl. All your weeping will make no difference to me. You must make ready, for there is to be a ball tonight at the home of Madame Clerval. A very grand affair. Annette will help you dress. But, Aunt, I have... A headache. May I not be excused? Indeed, you may not. You will make yourself ready and come. Dear Signor Montoni will be there, and Cavigny will no doubt accompany him. Oh. <clears throat> Can you not hurry, mademoiselle? My lady is fretting below, and you know how sharp her tongue is when she is displeased. I do not want to go, Annette. I hate Montoni with his sarcasm. And Cavini with his flattering ways. Oh, but you may enjoy yourself once you are there. Yeah. There may be other young men. Oh, <laughs> Mademoiselle Saint-Aubert, you cannot always be pining for this Valancourt when your aunt is so set against you. I am not pining. <laughs> Look at me. My heart is as free as the birds that sing. But mine is not. I fear it is with another and always will be. Mademoiselle Emily... May I have the pleasure of dancing with you? I think not, Signor Cavini. I... Oh, there is Valenco. Mademoiselle, you are faint. C can I help you? It is uh, nothing. I thought I recognized somebody. Tell me, who is the lady dancing with that handsome young man over there? Well, oh, you mean the one who is attempting to dance with the young chevalier, <laughs> who appears to be accomplished in everything but dancing. She is Mademoiselle Demery, and she is ranked among the beauties of Toulouse. She is lovely, is she not? Indeed she is. Very. 
and her fortune will be large. But it is to be hoped that she can find a better life's partner than a present dancing partner. The young man has just put the whole set into a great confusion. He has. Oh, he has. <laughs> oh, he is coming this way. Where is my aunt? She is beside you. Emily, my dear. Aunt, here is the Chevalier Valancourt coming to pay his respects. Madame Chéron, Mademoiselle Emily, I am so pleased to see you again. Good evening to you, sir. If you will excuse me. Oh. I beg your pardon, my lady. I did not know you were acquainted with the Chevalier when I criticized his dancing so... But I am afraid the criticism was out. He is no acquaintance of mine, or of Mademoiselle Saint-Aubert either. He simply has the impertinence to admire my niece. Well, if every man deserves that title who admires Mademoiselle Saint-Aubert, I fear there are a great many impertinence. And I am willing to acknowledge myself one of the number. Oh, Signor, I perceive you've learnt the art of complimenting since you came to France. <laughs> but it is cruel to compliment children since they mistake flattery for truth. Do they indeed? Well, whom are we then to compliment? For it would be absurd to compliment a woman of refined understanding. She is above all praise. <laughs> and I have heard Montoni say he never knew but one woman who deserved such praise. And who could she be, I wonder? <laughs> I wonder, madame, that you do not guess. <laughs> ah, but here comes Signor Montoni himself. Come, madame Chéron. May I have the honor of leading you into supper? <sighs> and Cavigny. Perhaps you would like to give your arm to Mademoiselle Emily here. Mademoiselle. Pray, Montoni, hmm? who is that young man who intrudes himself at our table so impertinently? <laughs> Impertinent? But his name is the Chevalier Valancourt, and he escorts the young Mademoiselle Demery, one of the richest ladies of Toulouse. I am well aware of his name, but what gives him the right to such exalted society? Madame Chéron, you surprise me. It is whispered that Mademoiselle Demery and her very large fortune are to be given to Monsieur Valancourt in marriage. Surely that is not possible. What could she possibly see in him? He is of good family. And besides, he is your hostess, Madame Clerval's nephew. And she is very rich. Madame Clerval's nephew? Did you not know? He must have some expectations from her, for he is very much her favourite. I did not know. It is very interesting, to be sure. Oh, but Emily, my dear Mademoiselle Emily, what can I give you? Signor? Some fruit? Uh, some more wine? No, I... Oh, do take a little wine. It will bring colour to your fair cheeks, which are sadly pale. Monsieur Valancourt, come in, come in. Madame Chéron. You will be pleased to hear that I have changed my mind. Emily may receive your visits, and you may pass time in each other's society. But you must not be thinking of marriage yet. I had not thought. I would not think of... Well, not until I had ascertained the young lady's feelings. What is all this nonsense? Just thank me for my magnanimity. I do thank you, madame. With all my heart. So Valancourt made frequent visits to the house, and in his company I passed the happiest hours I had known since the death of my father. But then, Madame Chéron surprised me greatly by pressing for a speedy conclusion to our courtship. Emily, you must be married quickly. I want you off my hands. If this Valancourt suits you, I have no objections to make. His aunt, Madame Clerval, has offered to settle a goodly sum upon him. If I will arrange a dower for you. And what says Valancourt to this? He is completely agreeable, of course. But he insisted on my speaking to you first. Give me your agreement only, Emily, and we shall be more than satisfied. Then I do. I will. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, aunt. Oh, there, there. Do not <sighs> cling about my neck so. I cannot bear it. Have done, Emily. Preparations were made for our marriage, and my happiness seemed complete. But meanwhile, Signor Montoni had become the acknowledged lover of my aunt, and his ascendancy over her more absolute. And then one day, my aunt sent for me. I went to her little parlour where she sat waiting, a smile compounded of triumph mingled with a kind of jealousy on her face. Ah, Emily, come in. Come in, child. Is it to do with my forthcoming marriage? No, not your marriage. Mine. Yours? Yes. 
From this hour, you must consider the Signor Montoni as your uncle. We were married this morning. You are married? Why are you surprised, Emily? The Signor is a fine man. And now you must prepare yourself for a journey. We are to go to Venice immediately, where the Signor has a splendid mansion, and from thence to his chateau in Tuscany. And you mean me to accompany you? I have thought to be married. Oh, all that is easily set right, Emily. Signor Montoni is gone to acquaint Madame Clerval with the proposed journey, and to say that the connection between our two families must be broken forthwith. Broken? What are you saying? Monsieur Valancourt and I are engaged to be married. No longer. The Signor has forbidden the connection. He considers it to be greatly inferior to what you might now reasonably expect. And am I not to be consulted in this matter? You will be, when the time comes. I cannot believe it. I will not submit to it. I will not! Emily? <laughs> Emily! What is this I have heard? I can scarcely believe my ears. Valenco, you should not be here. I should not be here? Where else should I be, Emily? You are my betrothed. If you wish to see my aunt, she is indoors. But you should not be here alone with me. Good God, I don't want to speak to your aunt, only you. Do not be angry with me. It is none of my doing. And has it come to this so quickly? Are you so willing to resign me, hmm? I think it is Montoni I must speak with. Oh, do not. Do not. He frightens me. You are ill, Emily. You are so pale and thin. My dear, I love you. But can you not see that they will destroy us both? No, they will never do that. Valancourt, we leave for Venice tomorrow, and thence to the castle of Udolfo. And I have heard from my aunt's maid that, that it has a very evil reputation. Oh, Emily, I know. And that is why I had to see you one last time. I am condemned to absolute despair, but I had to see you. I had to warn you. Montoni's heart is quite set against us. He has other plans for you, Emily. I know that. They will not succeed. My heart is yours, and yours alone, Valancourt. Emily, I have heard some strange rumours concerning Montoni. Are you sure that his fortune is what it appears to be? That he is what he appears to be? I have no reason to doubt him. My aunt is quite besotted by him. I know little of him. And yet you are going to a foreign country where you will be completely in his power. Would your father have wished this, Emily? He would not have wished it. But he left me in the care of Madame Chéron. What else can I do but go with her? There is one other possibility. What is that? I can come for you very early in the morning. You could slip out of the house and await me here. We could run away together and we would be married before they could find us. Oh, my dear, no. Do not even suggest such a thing. But surely the disgrace of this is preferable to... to leaving you with such a man as Montoni. He is an evil man, Emily. The reputations of both of us would be ruined forever. Then I must leave you. And heaven knows when we will meet again. Early on the following morning, we set out for Italy, where we spent some time in Venice. There I had a most distressing letter from Valancourt. My dearest Emily, I lingered at Toulouse for some time after your departure, but went at last to my brother's chateau in the neighbourhood of La Vallée. I have renewed my acquaintance with your good housekeeper, Teresa, but I have news to impart which will be of no great comfort to you. La Vallée is let. And I have reason to believe that this is without your knowledge and on the instigation of your aunt and Signor Montoni. I rode there this morning for the last time and heard that the new tenant has arrived and poor old Teresa is gone. Where, I know not. But I will do my best to find out and help her if I can. There is some wickedness at work here. But still Lavallee is only let and not sold. I have received a summons to my regiment and now I will join it without regret since I am shut out from the scenes which were so interesting to my heart. Oh, Emily, surely we are not to be separated forever. Oh, my dear Valancourt, surely, surely we are not. From Venice, we travelled across the country towards the Apennines. Our way lay by deep, dark valleys between mountains, and towards the close of the last day of our journey, I looked up and saw the dying rays of the sun streaming in full splendour upon the towers and battlements of a castle that spread its extensive ramparts along the brow of a precipice above. Hey, Zudolfo! We have come home at last! Oh, that is Zudolfo? Oh, Aunt, look! I see it plainly. Carlo! The castle of Udolfo. 
I see it all too plainly, Emily. I had not thought. What? Good God, does it not chill your very soul to look at the place? Oh, oh Emily, to what have I brought you? Open up! Open up! Carla, where are you? Your master has come home at last! He calls it home, but it seems to me that the castle of Udolfo is more like a prison than a home. Nonsense. We must take courage. But it looks so wild, so unkempt. It is as though no one has lived here for years. The master and mistress are back now, Emily. All will be well. Please, God, all will be well. Come in, come in, sir and ladies. Your Excellency is welcome back to his castle. We have had but short notice of your coming. It is near two years since you were last within these walls, sir. You have a good memory, Carlo. How do you manage to live so long? I don't know, sir, for the cold winds that blow through the castle in winter are almost too much for me. But I am loath to quit these old walls, all the same. And how have you gone on since I was last here? Much as usual, Signor. Save that the castle wants a good deal of repairing. So I see. There is the North Tower, for instance. <coughs> Some of the battlements have tumbled down, and the roofs let in water like so many sieves. Carlo! Carlo! But there you are, sir. It is difficult to effect repairs without the money to do it. Yes, yes, yes. We will discuss it later and see what can be done. But I must have a fire in here, for it is very cold. And my new wife and her niece must have food after their journey. I will get... Your new... Praise be to God, Signor. So you are married, are you? I am. This is the new Madame Montoni. And this is her niece, Emily saint -Aubert. God bless you and keep you, ladies. <coughs> Sit down. Sit down, do. I will... Do my best to make you comfortable. We ate but little that night and spoke less. But at last, I summoned sufficient courage to question Montoni. Sir, may I be so bold as to ask the motive for this sudden journey? You may not. It does not suit me to answer any questions, so do not presume to harass me. I think it is time you went to your room, Emily. Then I will bid you good night. And you too, aunt. Good night, my dear. Oh, but Montoni, she does not know the way to her chamber. Your maid, Annette, will have been shown such of the rooms and passages as she needs to know. She will take her there. Carlo, send for madame's maid. If that is the young woman that came with you, she is already waiting by the archway there. Ah, uh, Annette. Signor. You may show Mademoiselle Emily to her room. Good night, niece. Sleep well. Annette. Yes, I believe I do. Oh, but it's such a strange, rambling place. They call your room the double chamber over the south rampart, and I think we must go up this great staircase here to find it. Madame Montoni's chamber is at the other end of the castle. So he intends to keep us well apart? It would seem so. Oh, what a wild, lonely castle this is, mademoiselle. I should be quite frightened to think I had to live in it for good. This way. Are you sure? I think so. That great hall downstairs looks more like a church than anything else, doesn't it? It does indeed. The other servants say there are ghosts that walk the castle. Screams in the night and terrible visions. But... Shh. Do you hear anything? No. Nothing. Annette, you should not indulge such fancies. You will terrify yourself. And me. Oh, mademoiselle, they are not fancies. I verily believe if I live long enough in this place, I will turn into a ghost myself. Well, I hope Signor Montoni has nothing of these stories. They would displease him mightily. Oh, I'm sure if his conscience is easy, nobody else in the castle has any need to lie awake. What can you mean? I should not say. We may be overheard now. <clears throat> this little passage leads to a back staircase. Or does it? Well, does it? No. No, I think I've lost my way. What should we do? Here is a door. Oh, do not go in there, mademoiselle. You don't know what you might find. Uh, mademoiselle! There is a suite of rooms through here. They seem very spacious. Bring the candle forward, Annette. Why do you hesitate? But nobody has been in here for years and years, mademoiselle. These are simply disused rooms. 
They may open upon the great staircase at the other end. Look, here are pictures. Old and damp, it is true, but they must have once been very fine. You see the soldier there? Does he not have a look of Montoni himself? He does. Very stern and mm. long faced. Perhaps it is some ancestor or other. What is this? A long black veil. What can lie behind it, I wonder? Why should a picture be so covered? Holy Virgin. This is surely the abomination they told me of at Venice. What abomination? I could never make out exactly what it was all about. Remove the veil, Annette. Aye, mademoiselle. <laughs> Not for the world. Then hold the light while I lift the veil myself. No. I shall not. Then tell me what you have heard concerning it. It has to do with the previous owner of this castle. Before Signor Montoni came into possession of it. Dark deeds were done, lady. That is all I know. Well, well. I see you are superstitious and will not look. And neither will I, not just yet. Come, let the black veil lie. And let us leave this room. It has an evil air. But then so has the whole dark castle of Udolfo. Oh, Annette, will I ever see my beloved Lavalet and my dear Valancourt? Will I ever see either of them again? <laughs>